Great. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I am going to bring you back down to earth, actually, and talk about the octopus. Um, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to spend a week or so in the company of about 20 octopus vulgaris, the common octopus in this place. This is the Stazione Zoologica Antondon in, in Naples, in Italy. Um, as a guest of the biologist Graziano Fiorito. And I was there to sort of just get to know these, these creatures. And I think like everybody who spent any time with these creatures, I was left with a sense of a, a vivid sense of an intelligent presence very different from our own. So what I want to do in my 15 minutes is, is give an introduction to the mind of, of an octopus. And um, is it going? Um, OK, we see. Uh, and why do I want to talk about the octopus? Well, firstly, because it's intrinsically a fascinating creature. But when we're thinking about life and intelligence and possibly consciousness out there, paying attention to and studying the diversity of, of minds and of creatures here on Earth I think is a great exercise for the imagination. It allows us to think about the space of possible minds, the space of possible intelligences, rather than thinking in terms of creatures maybe quite similar to ourselves um, in some other, other place. Uh, so this is the, the common octopus. It's been swimming around behind me, Octopus vulgaris. Uh, they are incredible creatures. They have eight arms, prehensile arms lined with suckers. They can change shape, texture, color at will. They have a jet propulsion system. They have an ink-based defense system. They um, have three hearts. And they are capable of very complex cognitive behaviors that rival many mammals. As you can see, this, this critter is figuring out how to get into a sealed jar to extract the tasty crab inside. They can solve complex mazes. They can learn simply by watching other octopuses. And they can, um, they can learn to use tools to, for novel purposes. So, the common octopus, the common octopus is really, I think, our terrestrial alien. In fact, some people think the octopus actually is an alien. The octopus uh, DNA was recently sequenced, and it's quite a re there's lots of remarkable things about it, which I won't go into. But uh, but the reaction was quite interesting that some people thought that the octopus DNA was literally out of this world and was rather alien. In fact, the one thing they get right here is that the plural of octopus is octopuses and not octopi. And I get very annoyed when people get that wrong, so, so remember that. Um, and let's go. I'm going to do that. So as Jim said, my main line of work is in studying consciousness and mainly studying consciousness in humans, and mainly studying consciousness in first-year undergraduate psychology students at Sussex, which is <laughs> people we have access to. But of course, doing this, it does lead you to wonder quite naturally, what about consciousness more broadly? What about in other animals, not just mammals, but birds, and especially for me, strange creatures like the octopus. So this is a paper that I co-authored with a colleague, David, who you'll see some of his stuff in a minute, where we try to figure out, based on what we know about human consciousness, uh, what, whether some similar mechanisms might be found in, in the octopus. So when thinking about consciousness, I've always found it useful to break it down into three different dimensions. And I'm not going to go into the philosophy of consciousness today, because that would, would take far too long. But the three different dimensions are... Oh, that's the definition. So the definition of consciousness, to start with then, is always argued about, but a very simple way to think of it is that for a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. We all know what consciousness is. People say it's mysterious, but it isn't mysterious. Consciousness is, is the most familiar thing for any of us. In fact, all we know is what it's like to be conscious, and it's what goes away when we fall into a dreamless sleep or go under, into general anesthesia and comes back when we come around. For each of us, consciousness is all there is. But to study it scientifically, it does help to break it down a bit further and um, break it down into three different dimensions when trying to map the brain onto properties of conscious experience. So the three different dimensions, I'm going to have to keep doing this, are level, content, and self. So level is how conscious you are at any one time on a scale from no consciousness at all to vivid alert wakefulness like you might all be now. Conscious content is when you are conscious, what are you conscious of? What are the contents of your conscious scene right now? The sound of my voice, 
um, and uh, the visual image behind me and so on. And then finally, conscious self, which is probably that aspect of consciousness we cling onto very tightly, the specific experience of being you or me, of being someone. And what I want to do is, is show how we think about these aspects of consciousness in a human, and then ask if we can say anything about the octopus. So let's take level to start with. And in the human brain, what's necessary to be conscious at all? Well, is it the number of neurons? No. Uh, the cerebellum, which is the little brain hanging off the back here, in fact has about four times more neurons than the rest of the brain put together. But it has almost nothing to do with consciousness. I mean, your, your experiences will change, you become discoordinated in, in movement and thought, but you will not lose consciousness. Is it any particular region? Probably not. There are some regions that, if damaged, will abolish consciousness entirely, but they seem to be more like on-off switches rather than where consciousness happens, if it happens anywhere. And is it, any specific, is it the amount of neural activity? Well, when you're in a dreamless sleep, your brain is pretty much as active as it is when you're awake, so it's not simply that either. Now, to cut a very long story short, uh, what seems to be going on, and this is the line of research that we're following, is that it depends, in being conscious at all, depends on specific ways in which different parts of the brain speak to each other. At the top here, you have uh, an awake brain that's been zapped by a pulse of electromagnetic energy, and what you can see is that the echo of that pulse sort of rebounds all over the cortex in complicated spatial patterns and temporal patterns on the right too. Whereas when you're asleep, if you bang on the brain with a bit of electricity, the echo is very simple, it's very short-lived, it doesn't move around very much. So consciousness depends on a particular kind of way in which different parts of the brain communicate. Now, could this happen in an octopus brain? Well, this is it's a schematic of, of the human brain. This is, you can see the folded surface of the cortex where most of the, the gray matter is. And if we look at the octopus brain, it, there it exists now, um, it's, it, it's, we know very little about the octopus brain. There's been very few recordings from within it. But we know a few things. Firstly, they have about half a billion neurons. Now, that's not as many as a human brain. We have about 90 billion, but it's six times more than the mouse. It's quite a lot of brain cells. However, the octopus brain lacks the connections, the kind of information superhighways that allow uh, information to travel very rapidly from one brain region to another in the human. They don't have myelin, which is this insulating material which, which speeds up the transmission of nerve signals. Um, so it's not entirely clear that, can we go on to the next? It's not entirely clear that the octopus brain can support the same kind of communication that the human brain can. But more importantly, most of the octopus brain is not in its head. Uh, there, this is that sort of sack at the back, that's the body, but mostly that contains the internal organs, the stomach and other digestion things. There's a small central brain, but more than half the neurons that an octopus has are distributed throughout its arms. So its arms are almost independent creatures. Go on to the next. So that's level. Maybe even an octopus arm could be individually conscious. What about content? Okay. So when we wonder what we're conscious of, the idea I like to apply, uh, appeal to here goes back to Hermann von Helmholtz, a German physiologist in the 19th century, and he came up with the idea of perception as inference. Now, this idea is basically very simple. The brain is trapped inside a bony skull. All it gets are ambiguous and noisy sensory signals which are only indirectly related to objects and things in the world. So what we perceive is the brain is a process of informed guesswork. It's the brain's best guess of what's causing its sensory signals. It's not, a, it's not just a, a picture of some objective external reality. It's a fantasy generated by the brain. And I can illustrate that with a well-known visual illusion. This is called Adelson's checkerboard. And if you look at patches A and B here, they look to be the same, they look to be different shades of gray, right? I hope they do, one darker than the other. But they are, of course, in fact, the exact same shade. And I can illustrate that with this second version here where I've joined up the two patches, and you can see they're the same shade of gray. And if I now bring this bar across, you can see indeed, I'm not cheating, they are indeed exactly the same shade of gray. If you put a light meter up there, they would have exactly the same reading. And if I take the bar away, they again look different. So what's going on here? What's going on is that the brain is applying its inbuilt knowledge, deeply encoded into the visual system, that uh, a cast shadow dims the appearance of objects within it. 
The brain knows this. You don't know that the brain knows this, but the brain knows this, and so you see that object as um, lighter than it really is. Another example, which is more kind of every day, is if you walk out on a foggy morning and you're expecting to meet a friend. Now, you might actually see your friend to be there until as you get closer, it, it turns out to be a stranger. What's happening here is your, your prior expectations about what's going on are shaping what you consciously see. And this means perception, instead of just being a reflection of the world outside, is you're projecting what you think is out there into, into the world and interpreting the echoes. So the perception is the brain's best guess of the causes of sensory signals. Now, humans, we're, well, we're very familiar with the senses that humans have. You know, we, we like to think of a five classical senses, vision, audition, touch, taste, smell, all operating by the same principle. But of course, we have more than five senses. We have vestibular sense. We, we have that sense of balance that makes you car sick when you try and read in the car. That means you don't fall over all the time. We have proprioception. We know our body position. I can touch my nose without having to look at my hand. We have this innate sense of body position. We have kinesthesia. We can feel our bodies move in space. We have interoception. A great deal of the information the brain receives from the world is from inside its own body, reporting on its physiological state. This is the basis of emotion, as well as stomachache. And then we have nociception, which is, which is pain. So we have way more than five senses, all operating on these principles. Now, what about the octopus? Well, octopuses have good vision. They can see in very low light conditions, even at the bottom of the sea. Um, they can even see with their skin. They can see their suckers uh, or, or their arms have light sensitive cells. They have good taste and they can taste with their suckers. Some of the uh, DNA sequence that was identified encodes for, for uh, proteins that seem to have to do with taste, and they're expressed selectively in the suckers of the octopus. And they have smell, touch, and pain too. Uh, but we, beyond that, we don't know very much. But I want to pick up on, the, on just how different it can be, and, and, and just hold off on a second, just um, the idea, if you can see with your skin, you can do some remarkable things, and one of the remarkable things an octopus can do is camouflage. What you will see here is a diver swimming towards an octopus. So let's have a look. So here he goes. The octopus is camouflaged pretty well. And there it is. And it can do that because it's, it's, it's using its skin vision to map the background. So that brings us on to conscious self, which is the last thing I'll talk about in the last two minutes. And conscious self might be where octopuses are indeed the most different. There are many ways in which we can experience being a self. We experience being and having a body. We experience a first-person perspective. We experience intending to do things. We know who we are with a name and a set of memories, and we are in a social environment too. But I want to focus in the last few minutes on the experience of being and having a body. And the idea here is that our experience of having a body is just the same kind of, underlied by just the same kind of process of informed guesswork. We take sensory input and figure out on the basis of that what is and what is not our body. And this is very well illustrated in this classic experiment called a rubber hand illusion. What happens here is that even for humans, what is and what is not our body is a very flexible, can you start the movie please, is a very flexible um, thing. So you can do this at home. You have somebody stare at a fake rubber hand, and if they look at it and you stroke the rubber hand at the same time as stroking their real hand, <laughs> then The brain assimilates the rubber hand. It's its best guess that that hand becomes part of, it, part of its body. So even for humans, we can make this, um, we can make this sort of this flexible mapping about what parts of the world are part of our body or not. And in our lab at Sussex, we've been extending these experiments using virtual reality, so we can we can give people even more bizarre experiences of of what is and what is not their body. For instance, we can embody people uh, with with dark scoloured dark-colored skin to see if they become more or less racist as a result of, of experiencing themselves. And that's, that's, that's true. I mean, people will do, do those experiments. 
And my favorite one coming up in two seconds is you can have people embody bodies that change dramatically in size, which, if you think about it, is a little bit like what an octopus does, changes dramatically in size. So this might be a sort of ex experiment in what it is like to be an octopus. But could you do the same experiment on an octopus? What would it mean to give an octopus a rubber tentacle? Well, if you're an octopus, firstly, you're changing size all the time. But if you remember back to that first movie, you know, our bodies are relatively fixed in space. We don't have that many degrees of freedom. An octopus faces this enormous challenge of how to avoid getting all tangled up. They don't get tangled up. And they solve it in a very different way. Whereas we have this sense of proprioception, which tells us where our body is in space, this would be an intractable problem for an octopus to solve. So it has a chemical-based sense of self-recognition. Each, each arm secretes, each octopus secretes a particular chemical that is only recognized by arms of the same octopus, and it won't attach to it. And there's a whole series of rather macabre experiments involving severed octopus arms, and you see that a severed arm will, own, will attach to anything else apart from itself, another severed arm from the same octopus, um, uh, but it will attach to other arms or other octopuses and so on. So this is this, the arms grow back, by the way. So it's, it's sort of it still doesn't sound very nice to me. Uh, but but I didn't do these experiments. But um, so a very different way of of being a self that the octopus has. So let me finish now and and bring it uh, to a conclusion by saying that considering the octopus, I think emphasizes there is not just one way of being conscious. We are all conscious in slightly different ways in terms of the experiences we've had. Maybe some of you are synesthetes and see different colors. But it gets much more crazy than that when we look at the animal kingdom. There's a vast space of possible consciousnesses. And zooming back out to the stars, this allows us to ask the question for this evening in a different way. We can ask, you know, are we, is consciousness unique in the universe? Did it only happen here? Are we really alone? Or is it here, there? and everywhere. And thinking about this question, it seems to me that if we get rid of the idea that consciousness has to do with complex thinking, rationality, the, qu the qualities of language, the qualities we think of essentially human, it starts to make sense that consciousness, the most basic sense of consciousness might be the experience of being embodied. And that we might think that some forms of conscious experience might arise wherever there are complex life forms that care about their own persistence and that have to deal with complex sensory information and guiding their behavior in worlds full of danger and opportunity. So consciousness really might be out there. Thank you.